Hey, everybody, and welcome. I am Morgan Gis McDonald, founder and CEO of Paper Raven Books, and I have with us today a super special guest. He is the author of a brand new book called Amplified Unleash your potential through the power of music. And he knows a lot about music because this author is a multi-platinum selling record producer, Grammy nominated songwriter, social entrepreneur, author, and award-winning filmmaker. I have with us today, Frank Fitzpatrick. Thanks for being with us, Frank. Uh, it's great to be here, Morgan. It's great to be here with you and uh, happy to be with everybody, so. We are so excited because you are launching this epic book, Amplified, um, and it's launching now, and this has been quite a while coming. I know you have a whole career in the music space, and, and this book is specifically about unleashing your uh, potential through the power of music. Can you tell us a little bit about Amplified and, and why you wrote the book? Well, I wrote it. It's uh, been a long time coming, so, you know, since I was young. I won't go into that story yet. We can talk about that later, but... Um you know, to basically give people like you and, and the readers the knowledge and resources and ability to transform the way they experience and use music in their life, to take their life to a whole new level, to help them uh, experience less stress, to help them focus better, to help them enjoy their relationships and make them stronger. There's not really an area of our life that we can't add music like this secret ingredient to a recipe where we can basically up level and, and enhance our capacity to experience that part of our life and um, our relationship with the world around us and the society in which we live. And I've just watched over my career of, you know, 40 years and even before that, that you know, even though everybody knows about music, most everybody likes music, it would be hard pressed to find anybody who doesn't. We're not taught really how to use music to help us when we really need it, you know, or to help us really thrive. How does music make us more successful in our career? How does it help us when we're having a hard time in relationships and bonding? How does it help us, you know, when we're stressed and feeling depression? And how can we really actually use it in very practical and real ways? We're not taught this, you know, it, should, it seems to me that there's a bit of a gap there because it, for thousands of years it was used that way and, and uh, people are mainly taught how to perform <laughs> and or, you know, or to be, a, you know, to sell it as a commodity, which all of which are good, but is not the full range of human experience. And, you know, I'm, as I look at the future of where we can go with music and the intersection of human potential and what we're learning about health and where technology is going to bring that into play, you know, I see a whole new threshold of which, you know, music will be it, I think it's as important as any practices we're using now, meditation, exercise, and, as, you know, especially when you stack it, is what we say, you know, we stack neurological triggers and not to get too complicated, but it's, it's a great magic ingredient, you know, and scientifically validated ingredient to add to any of those life experiences. And I'm curious, Frank, like, when you think about your own sort of daily practice or, or seasons of your life where you've really leaned into music as um, something for you personally, I mean, sure, you've been doing music for decades professionally and award-winning and all that, <laughs> but for your own peace of mind or sanity or well-being, like what sorts of, how do you integrate music into your own life? Well, let me just, I, this, now we're going to go back to the seed of where this came from, because um, I have to, I can honestly say if, if I didn't have music in my life as a kid, I wouldn't be alive today, you know, and it had nothing to do with performing and it had nothing to do. It just had to do with growing up, you know, in Detroit at a very rough time and the streets were pretty rough and, and uh, it was a pretty confusing time in the early 60s and early 70s. And um and uh, music became my drug of choice, fortunately, because I lost a lot of friends to other ones. And, um, and, and I made a commitment at 12 years old that I was going to, that, you know, when music, you know, listening to Marvin Gaye scream in my ear <laughs> with his beautiful voice and, you know, watching young Michael Jackson dance, you know, and inspire me and, and listening to the, you know, the Beatles or Aretha Franklin, you know, um, all of which were Detroit except for the Beatles. You know that that was that that was really what saved me from you know you know really could have been you know a, a very ill fate 
And um, so when I think about today, you know, and fast forward and I look around and people are looking at COVID and what's going on, I go, well, this looks a lot like when I was in Detroit and Detroit kind of collapsed as from being the top city in the world, middle class city in the world to the tech center of the world. It was the Silicon Valley of the <laughs> of the era. And it was and just to going to 30 percent unemployment and places boarded up in really rough times and people feeling very cut off and isolated and. and I go, this is really familiar to me. This and and when I look at what's being offered for solutions, and everybody's working hard to bring solutions and to help people with their mental health and these crises that are happening beyond the actual um, COVID as a as a virus, um, I I still see the same gap. You know, I see still see the 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 gap that there are ways we can be using music in a really effective, validated, proven way. To help people through these challenges and to help them thrive going forward. So, to me, it, it's um, you know it's really important to get the book out. I've I've been on a mission for a long time. Uh, built a nonprofit organization, had campaign around the globe, done talks all over the world, done think tanks, help you know leaders in, in many different ways to integrate music into healthcare and education and different aspects. But I can't think of a more important time now. And for me, the book. Um, allows me to get it into people's hands as many people as possible. And that's really my number one goal is to get it into as many people's hands as possible because I'm confident that if, if they receive it and they and they read it and, and they even take some piece out of it, they'll find some way to to either help them through a challenge or to thrive in their relationships, to help their families as a mother with their kids, as an entrepreneur trying to build a business. Um, as a healthcare worker, you know, or somebody trying, and then, and then the view, the vision of where we can go in the future to me is just awe inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you for giving us some insight into, you know, your, your childhood and, and yeah. why this has become so, so important to you. I mean, that, that, um, desire, that motivation is really present in the book. I mean, you know, yes, there's a lot of ways that music can influence our lives and you sort of break that down. And there's a lot of research to kind of demonstrate the neuroscience and the biology and even the anthropology and the culture behind music. And, and really when it comes down to it, I feel very deeply in the pages of Amplified that you want us to really apply this and like integrate it into what we're doing day by day. And, and I'll just share like, you know, one thing from, from reading the book and, and going through this process with you, Frank, is that um, I, so I'm a mom, four kids, right? And running a business and all that. And I had grown up playing the piano and uh, my husband's a violinist, uh, not professionally anymore. He had a BM and then went on to do something practical and became an attorney. Even. <laughs> uh -huh. But we both have sort of an appreciation for music, but have lost kind of the daily practice. And so we have a keyboard that sits by the, you know, the family dinner table that Theoretically, someone could someday play, but but doesn't really get <laughs> sort of played very often. And of course, the joke is that when one of the kids starts to play, my husband with his musical ears like, oh, that's that was very dissonant. <laughs> and so one of the exercises that you gave inside the book is like, look, if you want to reconnect with that musician in yourself, play black notes on the keyboard just the black notes, because those will harmonize. <laughs> and you don't even need like a plan. You can just sort of sit down at the keyboard and just play black notes until you kind of like feel the music. And we did that. And it was so fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> everybody had fun. The kids and your been... husband didn't get mad. <laughs> My husband was not sort of That's covering right. his ears. <laughs> right. um, it, was, it, was, it was really fun just to see what each of the kids kind of came up with and and ever since then, it's been months, um, they will occasionally just pull off the cover and, and they'll start playing. And if dad's not home, then they can play whatever. <laughs> you know, and, and the oldest is starting to ask about reading. Right, music. Right, and so right. It was just one of those things where the instrument was in the house, <laughs> but it just wasn't being integrated into, into our family. And, and it's, it's opened up other conversations. The kids are like, oh, while we're making dinner, can we, can we listen to this song or that song? Or um, can I hear what a, you know, what a trumpet sounds like? And then we ask Spotify, you know, to play a song. Right. So it's, just, it's amazing what it's opened up sort of relationally and, and um, with very simple sort of practical exercises. So have you heard from other people about like kind of coming back to an appreciation for music after being away for a while? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a big piece of the, you know, a lot of people get um, 
because we're brought into our relationship with music is like I said before, typically around performance mm -hmm. and or so you study it and then you try to get to a certain level. You know, if you're a violinist, you try to get to first chair so you can play in a first chair in an orchestra. If you don't make that, you're what do you do with your life? You go become something else and then you kind of have this bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. But it was and, and then same thing with, you know, people take piano lessons for 15 years and can't go near a piano it's uncomfortable for them actually it's it's because it brings back all this like you know just it's it wasn't an enjoyable experience and it's not that that can't be enjoyable and that those that's not important if you want to become a performer but we shouldn't limit the pathway of people experiencing music dependent on that they have to become a performer that's like anybody who plays sports has to win the olympics you know it's just it's there's a lot of reasons to play sports um and just have fun with it, even if you're not that good at it, it doesn't really matter. So Beethoven says, not to sidestep this a little bit, but they, Beethoven says, you know, music's a form of higher intelligence that understands humankind, but the humankind's yet to understand. Mm -hmm. So I actually switch our relationship to music, that music has a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. And music wants to have a relationship with us. And music's part of our DNA and it's constructed in a particular way. So there's, you know, you learn in the book about the seven faces of music and the way it can show up in their life. There's a children's book coming that they can relate to each of those characters and have them help them out, whether it's the teacher, the healer, the friend, and music shows up this way for you. So music wants to have a relationship with us. So you shift from playing music or performing music into music, allowing music to play you. Because ultimately, if there's any lesson that comes out of this is that you're ultimately the in instrument, we are the instrument, and we are ultimately the reader is the gift. Mm -hmm. So it's not what they have to do unto music <laughs> to do something in their lives. It's like what music can help them do unto and for themselves, you know. So and, um, you know, going back to the black notes, you know, you know, exercise was um, Thank you, Graham Nash, for the song that inspired it. <laughs> it's, uh, but it allows you to not have to think about performing and to just close your eyes and allow the music to connect you, almost like a meditation, mm -hmm. very much like a meditation, right? So we don't sit down in a meditation and go, okay, I gotta, I gotta knock it out of the park with this meditation today. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, no, we go, okay, I, how do I get to this space, this place, and and. And many musicians who are so trained in the traditional ways don't get to that place unless they stay at it for 40 years, 50 years. And then they get to a level of mastery where they no longer ever have to think about their performance because it's gone, you know, they're never thinking about that part anymore. Like it's like a sports player like LeBron James. They're then in this, they're in the zone and the, they, they're in a space where they can receive the music fully, you know. And that's like a mastery level. So you can bring somebody into that mastery experience without having musicianship. It's, it, it gives a whole new way for them to enter the, their relationship with music. And that's really ultimately out of all the science in it and, and all the other, you know, lessons and all the stories and, and all the, you know, people that I've worked with and learned from, um, you know, at the end of the day, I want the reader to come away with this relationship with music that's been transformed or opened up in a way that really has real impact on their perception of themselves, you know, their capacity in the world, their relationship with others. And there's a number of exercises, you know, you talked about your family that you can do with family members mm -hmm. or with, in, with relationship, especially between generations to build stronger understandings of each other through music because we can talk about the music we love easier than we can talk about our feelings and our experiences. Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, there's many ways to open the gates to these, you know, kind of touchy and tenuous and places in our lives where we can actually break them down and, and have, live a much more fulfilling, exciting life. Yeah. You know, again, it's, it's, um, we're talking relationships now, and that's just one avenue. I mean, we can talk about, you know, how if you are going for the gold, you can improve your performance yeah. in sports. And, you know, and if you are, you know, having some sort of depression or, you know, anxiety, how you can go for that or sleep trouble. Or if you want to meditate, learn to meditate with music. If you want to learn to sleep, you know, deal with sleep issues. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, antidotes. Um, and I was also just, you know, you didn't ask me, but I'm, <laughs> because this is important, because I, I also work um, on the faculty of exponential medicine and I work in health and technology um, with some pretty big leaders in the field. 
um, in addition to the, what I've done in the past in entertainment. And um, so the book has to stay at a be, be at a certain standard, you know. So yes. I've it has you know the you know one of my mentors and and you know the heroes in the field, Dr. Daniel Levinton, the leading yes. neuroscientist, who wrote "This Is Your Brain on Music," wrote the foreword for me, and and it's been vetted by all these neuroscientists. But I didn't want it to be academic, so that's where I bring my experience in entertainment and storytelling and and try to bring that in. But I did have to have it like be validated mm. so that I wasn't just making stuff up or pulling stuff that in the research that wasn't really going to serve people in a in, that hasn't been time tested and proven. Right. So within, you know, you're referencing Singularity University Exponential Medicine. So within kind of this emerging like innovation, technology, health uh, side of music, what are some things that you have seen that you're excited about that you've maybe discovered or that has been discovered in the last you know few years that that's pretty exciting and promising well there's um you know we could go we could go a long ways in this so i'm trying to keep it just, just give us one. there's tons I, in the I, book so if people I, get write the book. A, I write a whole column on forbes on this that if people are interested they can go to amplified future dot com and that'll take them to the Forbes column and I write about what's happening at the intersection of human potential exponential technologies and music but it you know just in and there's a one chapter in the book but what's exciting to me is is where we can go because basically you know not in the not too distant future um, you'll be wearing your earbuds that you listen to your music with they'll be tracking all your health biometrics in real time on your phone telling you what you were listening to when how it affected your blood pressure how it affected your sleep st scores how it affected all these different areas of your life in real time and and offering responsive solutions that that will help you to return to that as a as a as an ongoing practice so it won't be any more of I think I like that one and it was this it was and, and now what that's pushing the industry to do is to actually come up with all these different technologies that measure the efficacy of music on certain desired states like you know to relieve anxiety or to um, you know improve you know sleep preparation or to any of these so there's a real push you know because this is happening and that where it's going to just evolve into an in, you know a normal piece where you, because you, I can basically even with what we have now but it's going to be not in the mainstream market you know design into an earbud and in 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 your iphone basically enough technology to get most most and more than the sensors you would have in a, in a good hospital room maybe not at that clinical level but enough to really send stuff to your doctor or do personalized precision medicine through music so redefining the future of music as, as medicine you know? So you just cracked open the whole <laughs> you know, health yes. and well-being, and you know we sort of talked about it can help with meditation, anxiety, sleep, performance. Um, what are some of the things that people come back to you? So you've been you've been uh, working in this field and teaching and 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 you know being a part of the research of this field for many many years. Um, is there any uh, practice or discipline that people kind of come back to you and say, you know, Frank? This was really helpful for me um, in in regards to to music in their lives. I think probably the the main one is the perspective shift, mm. like taking the expectation of that they have to do music, yeah. rather than receive music, yeah. and and um, and then just being able to process kind of you know you don't have to be into you know. Neuro neuroscience but if you are being able to kind of process that what you're listening to is doing things to your subconscious so it's like a lot of people get people get really excited in talks when i you know i I'm a, was a film composer for years and still do some of that and uh in 30 seconds to a minute i can completely change the way you think and feel about anything but any image you're looking at by the way i change the music and so this is all this and but that's not just happening when you watch a film that's happening when you walk into a store that's happening when you walk into your house that's happening you know so we did a pilot program in the us uh lausd <laughs> for uh you know 11 12 year olds which is kind of, you know the formation of personality using music but for primarily to teach them it, to use it as a social and emotional learning tool you know and um the exercises that you know they loved was um when I broke down the characters of music, the seven faces, um, uh, to the teacher, the healer, I won't go through all seven, <laughs> you know, the, the muse for creativity. And, and, and then I asked them to write about a relationship that they've had in their life with one of them. Mm -hmm. When people write those stories, 
you'd be the, the stuff that comes out and the memories that they had and when they can define it into something and again start to look at it as more of a persona in their life a spirit in their life something that cares and wants good for them <laughs> you know it's a bit of a stretch for some people to think about but but kids grab it pretty well and um and it, it that's pretty transformative yeah well, I know for sure writers, you know, I work with, with writers all the time. Um, they have a relationship with music. You mentioned the muse, but certainly there is a there's a sense that, well, of course, music is going to influence your mind, your creativity, your cognition, your mood. Um, so, yeah, it becomes a question of are we going to be intentional about it? If we know that it's happening, um, are we going to turn our attention to it and, and sort of, um, yeah, almost recognize and, and be grateful for for how music can be so powerful in in our lives um, it's fascinating so I'm, I'm curious frank from a writer's perspective you were combining pretty you know serious research <laughs> you know academic um research along with you know your stories and and other stories other people's stories and even um sort of historical stories to make this narrative um about music what was that writing process like for you it was a long one, so, but let me, I'm going to give you one more of the exercises because, oh, yeah. because that, that might be more helpful to the people and then I'll come back to that, um, I promise, um, because I know people are always interested in the process. But there's another exor or exercise or, or set up in there called the power playlist. Um, so basically, it's, it's very, you know, many people do this in their lives already, but I just try to break it down really simple. So we organize playlists that become the way of the world. And, and um, so it's, it's good because, but if we if we're thinking about music as a tool to help us in functional and practical ways in our life, mm -hmm. then we can organize our music by that as opposed to by 70 soul hits and you know the music for tonight's party. And so I have this acronym called, you know, firm, which is focus, inspiration, relax and, and move or motivate, you know, and and so we do we set up so that people take their songs and they basically put them in one of those categories so that they have a playlist that they know that they, when they need, it's like, I'm down in the dumps. I just need to be inspired. They, they've, they've vetted this playlist. They don't have to go choose which artists they're going to figure out. They don't have to go through all the ads. They don't have to go through, yeah. they just go to, okay, I know that this is, and it changes and they can update it. And, but it's, um, and then if they need to focus and do work and, you know, get some writing done like a book, you know, and they, and so they like to work to break background music, then they have that laid out. So it's just having these like power buttons. Yeah. That like, okay, now I'm going to go for my run, you know, yeah. or I'm going to do my five minute dance because I'm tired of not being able to go out yeah. to the gym, you know, and they just know like they don't have to go into this whole thought process, open up their, you know, go through all these apps mm -hmm. and try to figure it all out. It's a very straightaway thing. So that's been really helpful for people they found. And I want to just sneak in a reminder that if you're interested, you're like black notes, you know, like uh, earbud oh, wearables, power playlist. This all sounds interesting. There's this book is jam packed. So just go ahead and grab your copy now while you're here and thinking about it. Paperravenbooks.com slash amplified. And um, and then Frank, back to the writing question. <laughs> what right. was the so writing, writing process for, like? Yeah. So the writing for this book was interesting or not, maybe not interesting, but um, started 10 years ago. Mm. Because 10 years ago, um, uh, Ariana Huffington asked me to write a column on a, a campaign, a global campaign I was starting called at, back then called through my nonprofit called Why Music. So I basically started writing about all these subject matters and I was speaking on them and doing TEDx talks and, you know, kind of traveling around the world. And, and so and then and then at one point I said, well, I've been writing a few years now for this column, like, you know, but, you know, people like blogs, they read, they go by, they're almost like social media now. Right? You know, it's so it's like, how can I like consolidate this into a way that can be really useful to people? And um, I started to do it. The next stage was I was invited by the the um, government of Brazil because they implemented the first mandatory music program in Brazil, the most musical country in the world, never had mandatory music education in the public schools. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to help with that and with tech, you know, building the technology side of it as well. And so I had to go, okay, well, how, what am I going to put together for them <laughs> besides the technology and the curriculum? I said, I better, you know, let me organize this stuff into a way that that is actually useful, you know, so there's been a number of stages that that even though it would have affected 43 million kids, would have gone to 240,000 schools. Um, it went up in flames, like many 
projects of that enormity, but but it's still it was a catalyst to move the writing to move the okay, how do I get it into people's hands, you know, even if it's, you know, through this book now so and then and then at some point I had to go okay, I, you know, I got to write a serious book, <laughs> it's like, you know, well, not serious, I got to get serious about writing a book. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then, you know, and then I really um, dedicated the time and, um, you know, got lots of advice from editors and writers and kind of had them review stuff I was working, what's good, what's not, um, mostly not, <laughs> so, you know, and you just, and, and it's, and then I had to get into the routine of, okay, I'm, you know, of, you know, I don't have all day. So it's like, okay, if I don't get two hours of writing, three hours of writing, then before the day starts, it's not going to happen. So you hear that from a lot of writers, unless you have the luxury of, hanging out and writing all day, but you, you know, you have family, a company, it's like you write books. It's like, you have to find like, okay, I'm gonna dedicate this window for, and then something really interesting. So then I got, you know, I go, okay, I'm gonna go with this, you know, put this book out and I got an agent, you know, I went the route of the agent and then he was shopping out to publishers and then, and, um, and then COVID hit. And uh, and then you know and and then he had to close down his division of the agency because they they represented mostly um, us as speaking authors and that's kind of where the revenue comes from not so much from books and and uh, so I got everything back in my lap and it was and when, for me it was um, disappointing but probably the best thing that ever happened because I spent the first year of COVID completely rewriting the book wow and it needed it. And and you don't really want to go back there because it's just like it's rewriting. At least for me, is like the the not the happy experience. Yeah. But it's just. But it wouldn't be. I would have never hit that mark that I can now go. Okay, I'm proud of this. I'm going to be proud of this in 20 years. I'm gonna. You know, I'm not just putting a book out to put a book out. I really want to be um, one of the. You know, the key memorable books like Daniel Levinton's was 10, 12 years ago. With this year, bringing music, I want to. You know, be one of the seminal books in the field. Not to for the notoriety of that, but just to really be useful to people. And so it helped me to really go to the next level with the writing. And that that was really hard, but really um, been probably the most rewarding in the end, because then you come away, you're going, okay, I've given it everything that I can do, and I'm now really proud of it. Um, and I thought that was also really important because, you know, now that we're in this hybrid publishing, you know, and you become a company, <laughs> I've now become a media company, you know, without intending to, um, which is all has its be benefits and disadvantages. We won't get into that, but but it's really important. It's it's a lot of work, and 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 it's you know the real work. You know, I hate to say it, I spent ten years in the beginning, but the real work starts when you're done with the book, and you got to find ways to get it through the noise and and get it and fulfill the mission because the mission doesn't get fulfilled until it's in the hands of the reader and in the heart and minds of the reader and without that i it's just a you know it's an exercise and a writing exercise but i that's not my mission my mission is really to get it in the hands of readers so so now is the real work and this is where you know i hope you know we're working together and we you know working with lots of others and we and you know um and my hope is that we get this into millions of people's hands and other tools and resources to make this happen in the world yes Yes, it starts with getting it out to the readers, for sure. That's that's where the book begins to truly live. Right. So, Frank, you've walked through this whole process, 10 years plus of, you know, uh, <laughs> deciding to put a book out. Um, I'm curious, now that you've walked through this process, is there anything that you wish you'd known earlier or anything, any words of advice or encouragement that you might give to a younger version of yourself, knowing what you know now? Um, I think I would have, well, I can't say I would have started writing earlier. I might have started writing books earlier. Um, I wrote very young. I published my first poetry at, in like 10, 11 years old or something. Um, but the, uh, but the, um, you know, I think, I think the first thing that comes to my mind and I have to admit it is discipline. You know, I just, you know, the discipline of daily practice, the willingness to throw something away. Um, you know, the acceptance that you're going to be, you know, I, I love what, uh, you know, nobody seems more disciplined than Stephen Kotler. If you don't know who Stephen Kotler is, he's a great author and, you know, um, and, and he's, you know, he's describes his writing process and you would think, well, this is the guy, he's the king of optimization and flow. <laughs> and, and he describes it. And there's always a point, he says, where I'm 
laying face down on my office floor, pounding my fist, going, I don't know what I'm doing, what am I doing? And just know that that's part of the process. You're gonna, the creative, I mean, I fortunately knew that from writing music and doing film for so long and you like, you have your good moments and then there's a lot of, you know, kind of slogging through and it's like, it, you know, until you break through. But just to know that it's just keeping at it and that you're not, and writing the book is a, is a writing a book is, is very hard and and hard things help us grow and be more creative and more um you know adaptable to other challenges in the life so bring it on <laughs> that is perfect <laughs> well you guys I want to give you one more encouragement to go get amplified unleash your potential through the power of music you can grab a free copy today paperravenbooks.com slash amplified go ahead and do that now while you're here and while you're thinking about it and Frank, thank you. Thank you thank for you, being Morgan. here today. Thank you, thank you for yeah. writing this book. It's been, I'm sure, you know, a labor of love and mission and, and work and um, all sorts of aspects of yourself just poured into, <laughs> into one book and, and you're really giving it to us as, as a gift. So thank you for, for writing Amplified. Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you to any, you know, you who are listening and watching and my invitation is to, you know, if you like the work, join us in the movement. It's a powerful movement. Music's a fun way to have a movement, <laughs> and we can really make a big difference in the world. If you know, and that's um, I'm not. It's that's much more important to me than you know the numbers of books. It's the number of differences and impact and the ripple effect we can create. And and it's not I by myself that's going to do that. It's every reader who who kind of comes forth and with this and resonates with it. Um, should they and and then uh, carries it into their life, you know, to transform the way the world experiences and uses music. Yeah, ah, oh, so good. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks, everybody. See you guys, next time. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>